Science! All right, D-Man. So I actually, the first thing I wanted to talk about in science actually happened last week. And there was just been so many cool things happening in space lately. Like, I have to, like, kind of pick and choose. Like you said earlier, it's going to probably apparently come to the point where this show is just going to be a science show. I'm down. What do you guys think? Yeah, I'm okay with that. Really. If we had like an all science show, would maybe you, just the science. Would you still the watch? <laughs> yeah. Would like... you still watch? Let us know. Um, but uh, so oh, this happened. Yeah. So Sorry. this this happened last week, and it's really really exciting. Voyager two has finally reached interstellar space. Why does that look like an eyeball? An eyeball. <laughs> Well, because this is showing you the edge of the heliosphere. Now, 41 years after Voyager 2 was launched, um, the, the spacecraft is now crossing the outer edge of the heliosphere into what is called the heliopause. Now, why this is a boundary is because we've known about this for a little bit. This is the boundary of the solar wind. What we know of as the, the hot solar wind kind of stops pretty much here. And... Um, Voyager 2's twin, Voyager 1, actually crossed this threshold in 2012. The difference now is that some of the instruments on Voyager 2 are still working. Voyager 1, we can still connect with, but most of its instruments are dead. Why? Is it just it's it's so many years? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's yeah. just, you know. Wear and terror they're of like, traveling through space. This mouse has more computing power than these spacecraft. In, wow. You know, so I mean, when in do battery we start life. Off? In the 70s. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, like, so, wow. so you know, it's lucky enough that we can even connect connect with these Just things. Just a Texas instrument flying out there. In the exactly. Nothing sphere. So, when Voyager 1 crossed, we knew that it crossed because we can track it and we can see where it is in space. But Voyager 2 is sending us data back, and we're starting to find out that it's providing what first-of-its-kind information and observations about the nature of this gateway of passing through the heliosphere. And um, before we get into it, I have a cool little clip from NASA explaining the Voyager mission right here. We have ignition, and we have liftoff of the Titan Centaur carrying the first of two Voyager spacecraft to extend man's senses farther into the solar system than ever before. They were launched in 1977. That's a long time ago. We say 41 years, but it's really two, two generations ago. You can think of what the technology was. Your smartphone has 200,000 times more memory than what the Voyager spacecraft have. And so it's just exciting that we've been able to get it into interstellar space. We launched two Voyager spacecraft. They were basically the same, but they were on different paths. Voyager 2 was the one that was chosen to do the grand tour. That is to fly by Jupiter, and then Saturn, and then Uranus, and then Neptune. And then after 1989, we began what is now called the Voyager Interstellar Mission. We were on a path we hoped to get to reach interstellar space while we still had power on the spacecraft to transmit the data back. And that's what Voyager 1 did in uh, 2012, and that's now what Voyager 2 is starting to do in 2018. The sun creates this huge bubble of plasma, ionized material, goes outward at a million miles per hour and creates a bubble. And inside the bubble, most of the material has come from our sun and the magnetic field has come from our sun. Outside the bubble, most of the material comes from other stars that exploded 5, 10, 15 million years ago. We have an instrument which measures the wind of coming from the sun and we saw that in fact there was no longer any measurable solar wind. We had left the bubble basically. The team has been looking forward for this for a long time and really working hard in an engineering sense to make this day happen and to keep the spacecraft with all the instruments on so that they could, all five instruments could sense the heliopause crossing and have data for that. What that means is that the Voyager 2 spacecraft is now traveling in interstellar space. Well, this is just contributes to the number of discoveries that Voyager has been making. And this is one we'd hoped we would have the chance to do. And fortunately, the Spose spacecraft were still operating when they reached interstellar space. It's really quite, uh, quite remarkable. Voyager changed our view of the solar system, really. I mean, we saw these active volcanic activity on Io. We saw the possibility of ocean on Europa. Just time after time, we were discovering things that we had not really even imagined some years before the Voyager mission. What makes it so exciting is not only do we confirm what we thought we knew, but even better, it tells us where we didn't know that there was something to be discovered.
So that's really, really cool. I, I'm i so enamored with the Voyager mission. It's like our first ever spacecraft that we sent out to really map our solar system, map the planets. You know, some of the first images that we ever got of, you know, close-up images of Jupiter, of Saturn, of Neptune, you know, were from these spacecraft. And to the, even the ability that we can still connect with it is is, is just, it's mind-boggling. The fact that it's 11 billion miles away. Is that right? Am I reading that right? Yeah. And we can still connect to this son of a bitch. Yeah. How did it travel that far? That is just insane. Just space. How did nothing just like blast it out of the air and just completely gone? It's in, it's incredible. It's incredible. And so up until recently, it has been um, transmitting data and seeing that there's this solar wind. And it's this this one instrument called the PLS on, on the Voyager 2. Um, it, uh, it's been transmitting, oh, there's this solar wind. And it's, what it does is it detects the electrical current of the solar wind. So now we can find out the speed, the density, the temperature, and that kind of stuff. Um, it observed a very steep decline in these readings starting on November 5th. And since that date is observed no solar wind. So we really know that this barrier exists and the sol- quote unquote solar wind only goes so far in this in the solar in the solar system before it just dissipates and it's gone. I mean that makes sense. There's got to be a limit somewhere. It's not going to go into infinite. forever, yeah. right? And um, so that's really really cool. The, the Voyager project scientist Dr. Ed Stone, who's a researcher at Caltech, said there is still a lot to learn about the region of interstellar space immediately beyond the heliopause. And like you said, D-Man, Voyager 2 is now 11 billion miles from Earth. The mission operators can still communicate with Voyager 2 as it enters this new phase of its journey. But because it's so far away, the communication from Voyager to us moving at the speed of light takes 16 and a half hours. Wow. That's how far away this thing is. So does that mean at the speed of light we can travel 11 billion miles in 16 and a half hours correct oh if we had a craft that could go the speed of light think star trek yep. um you could then go from to where this is in less than a day but huh. we have yet to crack that science problem of how do we go that fast it's insane yeah and the fact is if we need to get to the places that we see that might be other habitable planets we're going to need something maybe faster than this. Of course. Of and the other side of that question is, this is getting into oh, completely off topic, but I love it. Um, the other side of that question is, is even if we find out how to make that propulsion, make a ship go that fast. How do we not turn ourselves into jelly on the inside? We would die. Yeah. We, like, how do we survive going that fast? I'm sure that would be the easy part. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right. as a scientist. <laughs> okay, okay, so we got it. So the easy part <laughs> is taken care of, NASA. D-Man's got it on lock. I we'll just survive. think learning how to travel the speed of light would be way more difficult than learning how to survive the travel of speed of light. Man, you're probably true, because if we figured it out, we would definitely know you know, how to counteract whatever it's doing on, right. on the hull, and then therefore... See, it's the easy part, Jeff. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Scientist D-Man over here. <laughs> um, the other science story that I had this week that I thought was really good is uh, a... Another deep space spacecraft, the New Horizons spacecraft, has taken images of its next destination, and here they are. And again, if you're just listening to this as uh, as a as our mini episode podcast, you can go on over to our Facebook page when this came out, and right on there, I'm going to put some of these pictures up that we're talking about. But these are actual pictures from New Horizon of. Ultima Thule. This is its next de- destination. It was taken by its long-range reconnaissance imager, or its LORI, the high-resolution camera above this, uh, or on this spacecraft, the New Horizon spacecraft. Uh, the Kuiper Belt object, that's where this is, is 4 billion miles away from the sun. Now, New Horizons is only 24 million miles away from it, which puts it into a perspective a little bit. Uh, Dr. Hal Weaver from the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory said, as the New Horizons spacecraft closes in on its target, Ultima Thule is getting brighter and brighter in the LORI optical navigational images. These images were taken just 33 hours before the December 2nd course correction maneuver that fine-tuned the trajectory of this craft to get to this destination. Now, what's really exciting about this is that 
This is in the Kuiper Belt. Now, the Kuiper Belt, think of our asteroid belt, which is between us and Mars. This is the asteroid belt that is outside, basically puts a ring around our solar system. Okay. So it's past Neptune, past Pluto. That's the Kuiper Belt. It's the okay. icy, all these balls of icy rock, and we've never sent a spacecraft there to observe anything. Voyager actually skimmed it, but we didn't have anything in place for it to take any data or right, anything right. else. You know, like it, it just it made it there. This is the first spacecraft that we're actually sending there to actually see it. And uh, the mission—it's almost like our universe has its own rings, like Saturn. Yeah, in a sense, it really does. And uh, the mission team of this said, and this is incredible, the maneuver that they performed on December 2nd, it's the most distant trajectory correction ever made, and it was designed to keep New Horizons on track toward its ideal arrival time at Ultima Thule at 12.33 a.m. on New Year's Day of 2019. cool. And it's going to be only 2,200 miles from this body. And this is a huge thing. It's massive. It's 30 miles in diameter. Now, that's more than 10 times larger and 1,000 times more massive than most typical comets that we see in the sky. But to put it in perspective, it's only about 1% the size of Pluto. So oh, just it's to tiny. put it, it's, it's tiny, tiny but it's, but it's re- big. relatively big, but in the giant relative sense of things out in space, it's relatively small. right. And it's like I said, it's the farthest spacecraft flyby in history. Now, if you don't remember what New Horizons is, New Horizons is the um, spacecraft that we sent out to photograph Neptune and Pluto. In fact, back in 2016, that's where we got those high resolution images of Pluto for the first time ever. We saw this this celestial body look up close and personal, and we've never seen that before, and that's what this took. So since it took that, we were like, okay, let's keep going with it. And literally three billion miles away, we told it, hey, go this way now. And we've never we've never manipulated a spacecraft that far out. In it must have before. taken hours to receive those commands. Probably. Yeah, yeah. But in cr- mind blowing stuff. How? How? I don't know. It's math so is crazy. Nuts. Math is nuts. Ultima Thule orbits the sun once every two hundred and ninety three years. Whoa. Okay. And it, like I said, it's four billion miles from the sun and the Earth, basically. Um, and so we're gonna learn some stuff about. The, the Kuiper Belt, we're going to learn some stuff about this giant icy rock that we never knew, you know? And it's pretty cool that 24 million miles away, New Horizons has already taken pictures of it. That's crazy. I just, when, I just wonder when we're going to get to the point where we're sending things out like this to mine. Yes. You know? Cause Soon. We're, we're going to find, I mean, it, we're going to find materials out there that we'll want to bring back. And it may take like 30 or 40 years, but if it's like platinum, gold, you know, just stuff that we would expect to find and kind of need to, yeah. to progress our technology, then, I mean, that's when that's when I think the big change will come. I think so, too. And I think we're going to see it very, very soon because, I mean, we've already announced next year we're starting our trek back to the moon with the idea of actually creating, you know, long-term bases either on it or around it, and then, therefore, then we're going to get to Mars, and we're just going to be starting mining space because we're going to need all these resources once we're out there. How cool is it going to be when we can break out our telescope and look at the base on the moon and actually be able to see people on there? Yeah. How insane is that? It's coming. It's coming. And we'll talk about it on this show. Oh, shit. (laughs) 